Welcome, Explorer. If you're seeing this, it means that you're one of the select people who have been able to noclip into the back rooms. You ought to give yourself a pat on the back for that. You're one of the winners here. You just made it to level one, the habitable zone. You take a deep breath, sucking in a waft of thick, metallic air that tastes like an oil slick. Your first impression is that it looks a little like an abandoned warehouse that's seen better days, or one of those spooky parking complexes you were always afraid to walk through after late shifts at work. But here, fear isn't an option. It's like Dune. Fear is the mind killer. You lose your head here, and you might also lose your life. That's why you decide to venture cautiously into this new concrete mess of an environment, propelled by a mixed curiosity and the hunger nagging at your belly. There has to be something here. It isn't the same featureless nightmare that the last place was. Maybe here, you can find some well-deserved goodies. You continue to walk as the concrete world reels past you. The longer you spend here, the more reality starts to feel slightly altered. You notice that it's oddly cold in here, so much so that in some areas, deposits of mist hang close to the floor. In other places, the mist has thickened into slick sheens of condensation or dark, reflective puddles on the ground. The wrongness of a place like Level 1 isn't as obviously evident as Level 0, but over time, the creeping sense of dread seems to rise and rise. With every open space, illuminated by flickering halogen lights up ahead, with every long, dim corridor with phrases like Welcome to Hell and No One Escapes spray-painted on the walls. With every hall dotted with great concrete pillars that could be hiding anything, you start to feel your heart rate rise. You begin to wonder, weren't there meant to be people on level 1? You were sure that you read that back in the Manila room on level 0. The document had said, Level 1. Reaching this level should be your next goal. Our primary base, which is one of the safest locations for you, is located here. Level 1 takes the appearance of an infinite warehouse stocked with crates full of supplies. You haven't seen any of those mythical supply crates yet, but you're holding out hope. Because what else can you do? That thing about the primary base was also encouraging. That means other humans are out here, possibly even in force. Safety in numbers. Wouldn't that be a fine thing? Your stomach grumbles painfully again, and you keep walking. After what could have been hours of more walking, your heart flutters. You see a person in the distance, standing beneath a flickering light. And look at that. They're standing over what looks like a crate of supplies. At long last, it seems like your luck is turning in the back rooms. You break into a steady clip and make a beeline for the only human you've seen in days. You call out, saying you're here and you're human too. You can already taste the energy bars and the delicious almond water. It'll taste so good. But you can't help but notice the person leaning over the crate in front of you isn't moving. They aren't reacting to anything you're saying, like if they're a store window clothes mannequin just fixed into place. In an instant, you feel this unassailable dread wash over you. You grind your heels into the ground and come to an abrupt stop. As if sensing you now, the stranger jolts to life and begins to turn. There's something terribly wrong with his face, namely the fact that he literally doesn't have one. Just a smooth, slightly domed, egg-like face, with no features whatsoever. Moving almost robotically, the faceless man begins to walk towards you. You scream and run as fast as you can, perhaps sensing wisely that there is safety in the light. The entity you just ran into is a being commonly documented in the back rooms, known as a faceling. These frightening tricksters come in a variety of terrifying flavors, and if you don't want your time in the back rooms to be cut abruptly short, you're best off staying away from them at all costs. Not that you need to be told. You're already running for the hills, not even bothering to look where you're going, taking entryways and corridors at random, doing whatever you can to put greater and greater distance between you and it. By the time you actually feel safe enough to stop, you're in another place you don't recognize. And the faceling is nowhere to be seen. Thank goodness for that, right? But you realize there is no endpoint, no absolute salvation or safe zone. You just need to keep wandering and hope you don't encounter something even more dangerous. 
Here's the thing. There are, theoretically, plenty of actual, real-life human beings trapped on level 1 of the back rooms. The problem is, each level is constructed out of millions of miles of alien geometry, not bound by the same laws of physics that dictate our home dimension. You can travel through these haunted halls for a thousand lifetimes and never encounter another person. It's all pure chance. The only thing that matters is surviving the next moment, because that next moment is never a guarantee. Because when you're searching for salvation in the depths of the back rooms, you have to remember that there are always other things searching for you. You continue walking, still trying to catch your breath after your recent escape. You're so desperate for some food or some almond water, the drink that's allegedly inexplicably all over the back rooms. You're even hungrier and thirstier after the run. Damn it, why did you even want to come here again? Was life really so terrible before? You enter another warehouse storage room filled with large boxes, with rotted planks barely held together by rusty nails. More condensation here, and more of those large, dark puddles on the floor. That's when an idea crosses your mind. If the mist is safe to breathe, then presumably it's just water, right? And that means, in puddle form, it should also be safe to drink. Granted, you weren't exactly eager to slurp water out of a puddle, but these are the kinds of things you need to do in order to avoid a horrific death via dehydration. You pick the puddle that looks the least dark, settling on one that seems to have a slightly silvery quality to it. Not ideal, but it would do. You dropped to your knees and leaned in towards the puddle, preparing to swallow your pride and swallow some of this nasty floor water. You wish you were braver about this kind of thing, but believe it or not, your hesitation actually saved your life this time around. You're about an inch away from the silvery water when, in an instant, it takes the form of a terrible grasping hand and reaches for you. Your reflexes pull you back from the wriggling fingers, scrambling back on your butt as the puddle seems to reshape and transform. It had never been real water. It was actually another common hostile entity in the back rooms, known as a duller. The reason that even things as innocent as puddles can't be trusted in the nightmare space. Dullers are large, devious monsters that function as ambush predators. They take on a semi-liquid state and imitate an innocent puddle on the ground, just waiting for some unlucky explorer to come and stick their feet where they shouldn't. At that point, it'll latch onto its victim and never let go dragging them into its form and ruthlessly devouring them. Very few people who come into contact with a duller in their liquid form live to tell the tale, so you just nabbed yourself a hell of a lucky break from an otherwise certain doom. But you're not out of the woods yet. The duller now in its physical form begins lumbering towards you. You've got no time to recover. You need to get up and move right now. You spring up to your feet and run for it before the duller has a chance to go for round two. You keep running, room to room, hallway to hallway, through this warehouse straight out of perdition. It's exhausting. Is there literally anywhere you can relax in this place, even for a moment? If you're lucky enough to survive this horrifying episode, you can bet your ass that the future PTSD is already in the mail. But as you're running, you suddenly stop, noticing that you're in an oddly dark corridor. The lights flicker on only occasionally, giving brief moments of illumination. The active fear that came from running from the duller begins to melt away, instead replaced by the icy dread that you've come to associate with the many ambiguous terrors of the back rooms. You just know something terrible is about to come round the corner. You just didn't quite expect that feeling to be completely literal in its accuracy. With each flash of light, you see a door squeaking ajar and something moving behind it. There's a low, guttural growling noise, something primal and vicious. You get the sense that whatever's behind there, it is a truly dangerous predator. It enters, beginning with a tangle of filthy, matted hair that obscures whatever face might be underneath. With each flash of light, you see a little more. It has human skin, each of its limbs seemingly oddly human in isolation, but the configuration is all long. Its body is built almost like a hairless dog, a badly assembled jigsaw puzzle made of human parts. Also, it's hungry, and you look like food. You naturally turn to run, and it gallops after you on all fours, growling and snarling. While this living nightmare is new to you, it is a very familiar creature for veteran explorers and survivors of the backrooms. They're referred to as hounds, 
dangerous bestial monsters that hunt down survivors to either devour them or infect them. That's right, infect them. Because these creatures carry a dangerous pathogen, often referred to as the hound virus. It's fast acting, can spread through bites, and leads to a horrifically painful transformation that converts human beings into hounds themselves. Of course, that fate doesn't sound all that fun to you, so you run like hell. Remind us why you wanted to come here again. Don't get us wrong, we know bills, rent, the job market, and student loans suck, but there's gotta be a better alternative than this. Adrenaline carries you where more conventional energy fails to step up to bat. You can hear the growl of the hound as it follows you for about 20 solid minutes of relentless running. It feels like a miracle when you enter a new room and the growling behind you gives out. You're safe again, for now. And for now never seems to last as long as you would hope it would in the back rooms. You think to yourself, panting and on the edge of tears, born from a mix of immediate fear and low, nagging hopelessness, it isn't fair. It just isn't fair. That's when you see it, parked about a foot in front of you. A big, beautiful supply crate, made out of a relatively pristine looking wood. After the trio of horrors you've seen today, it feels like seeing the pearly gates. You approach with ravenous intensity and pry the lid off the crate with your fingers. Inside enough almond water and energy bars to last for days, you eat and drink your fill. It's the first time in a long time that you feel close to happy. Perhaps with this small light in the darkness, you'll have the strength to keep going, but nothing can prepare you for what you'll encounter next. After taking your fill from one of the supply crates, you take a moment just to breathe and assess your next options. You've been running through the halls of this hell like a headless chicken. It's time for you to calm down and get methodical. Otherwise, you might get lost in level one forever. Don't you want to at least find your way to level 2 before you bite the big one? You shove as many energy bars and bottles of almond water into your bag as you possibly can, just to avoid the encroaching horror of starvation and dehydration later. It's a little less exciting than some of the other ways you can die around here, but it's the most common way to go. Even if you're the kind of supreme badass who could kick most backroom entities through the nearest wall, you're still vulnerable to starving to death. So you continue your journey through level one, searching for some kind of way out. You read somewhere that finding your way through the right aperture can lead you to no clipping into level two. You don't know much of what's supposedly down there, but so far level one has been an absolute nightmare. So surely can't be much worse than that, right? Of course, you will come to regret thinking that. As you pass through warehouse floor after warehouse floor, corridor after corridor, you see something miraculous. Another human being dressed in cobbled together tactical clothes and wielding a machete, recently stained with black blood from some unknown source. But seeing black blood on this stranger's blade is definitely better than seeing red. The person smiles, raising the machete and asking if you're human. When you say yes, which to be fair he already knew, he lowers his blade and beckons you over for a handshake. The stranger tells you his name is James and that he's a raider. This frightens you. You've played a whole bunch of Fallout games, so when you think Raider, you think bloodthirsty psychopath that will kill you and steal your stuff. But this is only because you're not that familiar with some of the factions at play in the back rooms. Of course, there are far too many groups and factions to discuss right here, but all you need to know about the Raiders is that they're big fans of freedom. They hope for the back rooms to stay independent, rather than being ruled by the same systems of greed and corruption that rule the world outside. They want the backrooms to remain the strange new frontier that it was always meant to be, for those who actually want to be there, at least. James the Raider tells you that they lost the rest of their team in a scramble after they were chased by a whole pack of hounds. He even managed to kill one, hence the black blood on his machete. He's established a camp nearby, and if you want to come camp with him overnight, you're more than welcome. There's safety in numbers. You decide to take him up on his offer and camp out with James the Raider for the night. Perhaps in the morning, the two of you can go out on a hunt for an exit, or other explorers the next morning. He's busted up an empty supply box and used the planks of wood as firewood. It's clear that this guy has been here much longer than you. You hope with enough time, you might be able to learn from this man. Maybe with the knowledge imparted to you, the back rooms might become the fun, exciting adventure you hoped it would be. James says he'll take first watch, cleaning the blood off his machete with a rag. You can get some well-earned sleep at long last, 
and given how exhausted you feel, you welcome it. But it's a rough, uneasy sleep. You keep having dreams filled with strange images, huge, hissing metal pipes snaking off into infinity, glowing eyes and teeth in the darkness, looking at you, getting closer and closer. What does it mean? You haven't encountered anything like it in the back rooms before, so you have no idea where this frightening image comes from. But the eyes and glowing teeth keep getting closer and closer and closer. When they eventually reach you, you bolt upright, awakening with a scream. You're breathing heavily, drenched in sweat. The fire is down to its last dying embers. You're alive. You're safe. It's okay. It's no surprise that hanging around with the monsters in these otherworldly locales would lead to strange dreams. You look around for James, but you can't see him. Panic begins to tiptoe down your spine, vertebrae to vertebrae. Did he leave? Did a monster get him? All these thoughts race through your mind until a figure begins approaching you from the shadows. At first, you're afraid. Could it be a duller or a faceling? Nope, just James. You couldn't be more relieved. You ask him if he's okay, and he just flatly replies, Hello. You pause for a moment, a little confused by his response. But before you can ask another question, he simply repeats, Hello, once more in the same flat tone. You rise to your feet, realizing now that something is terribly wrong. James just stares at you. There is something terribly wrong with him. When the light above flickers on slightly, you start to notice how incredibly dead his skin looks. It doesn't look like his skin. It looks like something else wearing his skin. And in this regard, you're completely right. While you slept, James was attacked by an entity known as a Skin Stealer, which, I mean, come on, it's in the name. You can probably guess what a dude called the Skin Stealer did to your new friend here. There's no time to grieve. The Backrooms is an easy come, easy go kind of place. All you can do now is survive. You jump to your feet and charge into the nearest hallway as the shambling skin stealer wearing what used to be James chases after you. The back rooms may be a horrific place, but at least it's giving you plenty of opportunities to work on your cardio. You didn't do nearly enough of that back on the outside. You break into a mad dash until the noises of the skin stealer disappear behind you. You're barely even thinking. But when your mind slows down and resumes normal operations, you realize you're somewhere different. You're in a long, dark hallway, threaded with giant, hissing pipes like metal arteries. On the inside, you feel cold, but on the outside, you're sweltering. You recognize this place, exactly as it was in your dreams. Welcome, Explorer. Back so soon? Just kidding. We know you aren't going anywhere. You made your way into the back rooms not too long ago, and that's a one-way trip, dear friends. One way or another, you're going to die in here. The big question is which level you'll meet your end on, but you've at least made it to level two. Nobody can take that away from you. Well, actually, I can think of a few entities that can, but we'll discuss that later. You're on level two now. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Because we're sorry to inform you of this, but level one was easy mode. It's only going to get nastier and nastier from here. So far, the best thing you can say about this place is that at least it's a little more straightforward than level one. Whereas the former was a mix of rooms, halls, corridors, and closets, level two is a pure network of extra-dimensional underground tunnels. They stretch on with seemingly no end in front of and behind you connected to other tunnels stretching off in different directions, forming an endless latticework of overheated passages that you couldn't even hope to explore. But you don't intend to spend a lifetime here. Regardless of how long or short that lifetime ends up being, you start walking. You can't exactly see or remember how you got into here. Did the entrance disappear behind you, or did you just completely no-clip through the wall? Who knows? All you know is that you need to keep moving. You walk down the tunnel, holding and taking sips from the almond water as you go. It's so impossibly hot in here, like you're walking through a literal sauna. You need to dodge the occasional puff of boiling steam busting out of cracks in the pipes, knowing it'll probably boil your skin off if you get caught in it. You keep walking, remaining vigilant. 
When you hear strange scraping noises in the distance, you decide to make yourself scarce behind a small collection of jutting pipes. You're frankly sick of running at this point, so you're just going to put all those hours of outless playtime to good use, and hide instead this time. If it doesn't work, at least you won't survive to regret it for long. Something approaches, lumbering down the tunnel, dragging its huge claws along the metal pipes, screeching and spewing sparks. It's a huge gray creature with massive gnarled claws. The creature is known as a scratcher. It doesn't have any eyes, thankfully. It just listens extremely closely when it's hunting, waiting for even the slightest sound. It's hungry. It wants to feed. If you can stay quiet though, you might have a chance to survive this one. You hold your breath trying to remain calm. One strain noise means death. It's getting closer, probing around the pipes with its claws, its lips curled back to reveal gums and fangs. Is this going to be your last moment? Then somewhere deep in the distance, a pipe clanks. The scratcher hears the distant clank and gives chase, galloping on all fours down the pipe-filled tunnel at freakish speeds. You're safe again, for now. While you're hiding behind the pipes, you decide to unwrap an energy bar and quietly snack on it. Near-death experiences can work up a hell of an appetite. When you're confident that the scratcher is gone, you decide to crawl out of your pipe-filled hiding place and continue walking deeper into level two. Wiping the sweat from your brow with the back of your hand, the heat is unbearable, but at least the hiding places make running less of an issue here. And so far, the only monster you've discovered is blind. You've always been good at staying quiet, so maybe here you're going to have a slightly easier ride. Aside from the fact that warmed up almond water tastes revolting, you keep walking. Story of your life, right? But here somehow you feel a little more confident. You dare crack an ever so slight smile. Maybe you're starting to adjust to this whole backroom situation. As if just thinking that was enough to constitute a challenge, the lights above begin to flicker. You freeze in place as the section of the tunnel goes completely dark. Could it be another scratcher? Maybe you just need to stay still, but it isn't a scratcher. A pair of glowing eyes and a set of glowing teeth suddenly illuminate in the dark. You recognize it from your dream. It starts getting closer. Well, not having the proper nomenclature is really the last of your worries right now. The monster standing before you is a mysterious entity known as a Smiler. Their neon grins pervade many of the backroom's levels, hunting for easy prey. While they live in the dark, they're attracted to any and all sources of light. Lucky for you, you don't have your flashlight on you right now. But unlucky for you, you don't know all of this. Because if you did, you know that turning on one of your light sources and throwing it in the opposite direction is the best possible way to survive an encounter with a Smiler. How very silly of you. But hey, we can't entirely roast you for your behavior here. Staying frozen in place and maintaining eye contact really is one of the best things you can do in this situation, even as the grinning nightmare draws even closer. If you started to panic or turn to run, then the Smiler would take that as an invitation, leap on your back, and morph all over you. Nobody knows how exactly a Smiler kills its victims, but we can assume it doesn't just use all those long, sharp, glowing teeth for grinning. That being said, seeing as you're in a very narrow corridor right now, your options for escape are extremely limited. You're currently speedrunning all stages of grief until you reach a kind of placid, guess I'll die, acceptance. There are worse ways to go than getting chomped by a Smiler's glowing jaws, surely. That's when a ball of light sails over your shoulder from behind. It seems like an abnormally bright industrial glow stick, sailing in a smooth arc, bouncing off the distant ground and tumbling into the darkness. Lucky for you, it's enough to distract the Smiler, who immediately pivots and follows it into the darkness. Somebody just saved your life. Come with me if you want to live, calls a rugged, manly voice behind you. You turn and see him there, flanked by a pair of subordinates, both wielding planks of wood with rusty nails sticking out of them. He's a tall, broad-shouldered man, his lantern jaw peppered with light stubble, his biceps ripple out of his sleeves, his eyes a piercing blue, his hair is pulled back and tied into a manly ponytail. 
This is the man who saved your life. You're Jack, Angel. His name is Austin, and you don't hesitate for a second to run down the corridor with him and his men. He's the kind of guy you'd be happy to follow anywhere. He and his men lead you into a nearby utility room, where he's hidden a variety of supplies. Almond water and energy bars are plentiful, along with a wide variety of weapons. He tells you he's impressed that you managed to survive all the way to level 2 with so little firepower. As it turns out, level 2 is one of the only levels in all the back rooms that can be accessed directly from the normal world. You shudder at the thought. Going from level 0 and level 1 was bad enough. The idea of unexpectedly clipping from reality straight into this pipe-ridden nightmare scape feels like it'd be a one-way street to certain doom. Austin hands you a revolver, its cylinder full, as well as five additional bullets. He tells you that this might save your life someday, but if you're not careful with it, it could also be the catalyst for your demise. After all, guns are loud, and when monsters down here catch wind of a couple of reports, they'll come running like it's a personal dinner bell. You nod, taking it all in. Austin also tells you that what you're seeing here is a small detachment of his level 2 settlement. In total, there are about 30 people down here that organize themselves into small three-man scouting groups, going on daily reconnaissance missions and shifts to gain a better understanding of the mysterious area around them. Knowledge, after all, is power. It's the best way they can come to master the place they're trapped in. The next step will be finding your way to their main level 2 encampment, where the rest of the group is located. You can meet them and start your new role as a member of the team. While you initially wanted to go to the back rooms to see it all, to explore, to get some excitement after the horrors you faced, part of you just wants to settle down on level 2 for a while and earn your stripes. You can build alliances and train yourself with the different weapons available to you. So when, perhaps in weeks or even months time, you actually make your way to level 3, you can feel ready for the challenge. But the second you, Austin, and the two others step out from the utility room when you've been planning, restocking, and arming up, you're surprised by a sudden, confusing attack from a new enemy you've never encountered before. They roll towards your group down the narrow, pipe-filled corridor like tumbleweeds made of human flesh. A chaos of wheeling limbs with deranged, frantic energy moving impossibly fast for creatures that have such a chaotic construction. These entities are known as the Clumps. The person to the left of Austin runs forward, preparing to strike at them with his nail board, even when Austin yells for him to fall back. He's quickly swarmed by the oncoming tide of clumps, which beat and claw at him with their chaotic configuration of aggressive limbs. Austin yells for the rest of you to run and scatter as quickly as possible, or you're screwed. You heed his words, considering he's already saved your life with his expertise once today. Each one of you disappear down different corridors. The clump horde breaks up into smaller groups, chasing each one of you down. You lose sight of Austin and the other survivor, but now isn't the time to worry about that. You just keep running, hoping you'll find somewhere to hide from these disgusting new monsters. The pipes seem to heat up, going hostile, hissing more caustic steam. They hold no refuge for you now. You can only run, oh that old chestnut, as the clumps get closer and closer. But wait, what's that in the distance? Is that another door? To a new hallway? To a utility room? It doesn't matter as long as it puts another barrier between you and them. You speed up, making a mad dash for what could be your only salvation. You just hope to the god of the back rooms, if there is one, that the door is unlocked. At the last possible second, with the clumps hot on your heels, you reach the door and throw it open, slipping inside. You slam it behind you and lean against it, breathing hard, waiting for the boom, but it never comes. Congratulations, you escaped, but you're not on level 2 anymore. Out of the frying pan, and into the very jaws of hell. Welcome, Explorer. Just when you think you're out, we pull you back in, don't we? But don't worry, we'll be here to keep you company as you traverse ever deeper into the liminal nightmare that is the back rooms. And hey, would you look at that? You're on level four. What a beautiful place. Breathe in the twin scents of fresh, warm copy paper and what smells faintly like burning rubber. 
spread your toes on the shoe gray carpet. Take in the full glorious palette of gray on the many anodyne walls. There's a good reason that people call this level the abandoned office. It's funny in a bleak sort of way. Previous levels might have appeared more overtly spooky or dangerous, but this one sends a unique chill down your spine. You venture forth in eerie silence, keeping your distance from the wire-filled pillars that you know could be concealing all manner of freaky, aggressive monsters. There's an odd lump in your throat as you progress. You've been here before. Well, not here, exactly, but in offices just like it back in your native reality never in any position you were proud of. You were the intern, scrambling for coffee orders and trying desperately to remember the names of your superiors. You were the minute taker, dutifully recording notes as words you didn't understand or cared about flew past you a mile a minute. At the height of your power, you were just another numbers droid, inputting anonymous data into vast, incomprehensible systems for reasons that were beyond your understanding and pay grade. You never did anything of value and the pathetic paycheck you got at the end of every month only served to reaffirm this. Here on level four, you feel like you're walking through the carcass of a life you left behind, a reminder of the emptiness you ran from, and even the greater emptiness you've arrived in. You haven't even encountered a hostile entity here yet, and yet you feel your pulse pounding with an even deeper kind of existential dread. The silence of the back rooms emphasizes the loudness of your thoughts. There are so many things you tell yourself you were running from when you first set your mind to entering the back rooms. Bills, taxes, obligations, alienation, purposelessness, pain, regret, debt, wasted years, a crappy home, a crappy job, no friends, no family, not living, not even really surviving just being. But here on level four, you find yourself looking at things with a greater degree of clarity. Sure, all those things are problems, but they weren't the big problem, were they? The thing you were really running from was being you. And sadly, you're you here too. You try to push all those bleak thoughts out of your head. What does it help you to believe these things? The back rooms is all about survival. If you find yourself slipping too much into your own internality, it leaves you as a sitting duck for a truly dangerous creature, lurking out here in the mazes of hallways, electrical pillars, and abandoned dust-gathering cubicles. You have to be fully present and constantly aware of your surroundings. There's something oddly compelling about the environment of level four. Despite your own very personal existential baggage, this place is oddly more inviting than a lot of what you've seen. It doesn't have an endless drone or walls that are deadly to touch, nor nauseating damp carpets and a thick toxic miasma hanging in the air. It feels like a snapshot of the year 1999, on the precipice of the millennia and the world changing forever, just without any of the people in it. That much can be expected of the back rooms, at least. You walk down darkened corridors and through doors marked in a language you don't understand or even recognize. You're smart enough to know the drill by now, explorer. You need to search for supplies, other friendly explorers trapped in here with you, and of course, an exit to the next level. You keep walking for hours, occasionally breaking to sit on a rotating office chair, just for your own amusement. The lack of entities on this level seems almost conspicuous, doesn't it? Especially after what an onslaught of vicious creatures these last few levels were. Not that you want to look a well-earned breather in the mouth. There's another thing about this level that you can't help but find a little peculiar. This is the first backrooms level you've seen that has actual windows here. Of course, some of them are completely blacked out, as can be expected, but some of them seem real, with actual light filtering through them. Does that mean there's a way out? Or at least some kind of externality to an otherwise claustrophobic nightmare that is the back rooms? Tentatively not even daring to hope, you approach one of the windows. Something has to be exuding all this light, doesn't it? But outside, you see another impossibility that seems typical of this baffling alternate dimension. A spiral made up of thousands of other parallel windows built into an endless tesseract of walls. 
Down below, it stretches off into a kind of dark and unknowable infinity. Part of you wonders what'll happen if you'll pry the window open and jump out, but you're aware that it might go on for billions of miles. For all you know, there might not even be a bottom. You could be doomed to die of starvation mid-air. So perhaps an experimental jump isn't the best idea, you think. But this does open up a few different fascinating lines of inquiry. You know this is the view out of one of the windows. Who's to say it'll be the same out of the others? You've entered new levels through plenty of means before. No clipping, doors, elevators. Who's to say you don't enter level 5 by climbing through an office window on level 4? So you begin checking the windows. Again, many of them are totally blacked out. You consider trying to scrape away the paint at first, then realize that in the back rooms, if the world itself doesn't want you looking at something, it's best to be compliant and heed its orders. You don't want to end up like one of the many thousands who would see something so terrible in the back rooms that it utterly shattered their sanity. You keep looking until you see something that catches your eye in the distance. Is someone standing behind one of the windows? It seems like a mere silhouette, but from the shape of it, it seems like it's a human, not one of the many vaguely humanoid monstrosities that littered the endless miles of the back rooms. And if it was possible to get onto the other side of some of these windows, then maybe your theory about escaping level 4 via one of these windows actually holds some water. There's only one way to find out. There's no time to waste. You make a run for the window, hoping the person on the other side will see you and open up. And as luck would have it, they do. The window starts to open and you see the person on the other side reaching out to take your hand and help you over the ledge. You're delighted. You couldn't be happier to leave this horrible level and all the painful memories it dredges up within you. That's when you hear someone scream, no. You're stopped in your tracks as the iron grips of several hands clasp around your body. You panic and begin to thrash around, worrying that some of the entities have gotten the jump on you. But in reality, the exact opposite has happened. You take another look at the hand reaching out of the window for you. It's solid black, like a living shadow, its clawed fingers extending towards you, grasping, clawing, beckoning. The ones grabbing you and pulling you away from its demonic grip, on the other hand, are all too human. They know about the treacherous window monsters that lurk on level 4, and they have no intention of letting you fall victim to their tricks either. When they pull you far enough from the window that the hand begins to recede back behind the panes, they loosen their grip and let you breathe. You'll sure as hell be bruised tomorrow, but at least this way, you're actually going to live to see tomorrow. Because your mama raised you right, you thank your rescuers profusely before asking them who the hell they are. They tell you that they're a scouting party from the Major Explorers Group Base Omega, the largest human faction in all of the back rooms. With them, you're in safe hands at the very least. Once you've gotten over the shock of yet another near-death experience, they help you up and escort you to Base Omega. It's heavily fortified, despite largely being made of discarded cubicle pieces and office furniture, and surrounded by a sizable force of major explorer group soldiers, wheeling everything from machetes to assault rifles. Your saviors tell you that this is the second largest base that the group operates in all of the back rooms, and because there are relatively few entities on level 4, a large number of humans congregate there. It's a relief to know that even in an environment as terrifying and utterly inhospitable as the back rooms, the human race, or at least pockets of it, can still find a way to thrive. You're offered food and plentiful almond water. As you sit with a group of fellow explorers eating, drinking, and swapping war stories, you decide to pose a question you've been wondering for a while now. What's the deal with almond water? Rather than reeling off into some bad imitation Seinfeld spiel, a fellow explorer tells you that almond water is more than just a refreshment, it's a lifesaver. Not only will it stop you from dying of dehydration and malnutrition, but it will also boost your immunity from the aggressive pathogen that turns you into a wretch. In some cases, the chemical content of almond water even seems to repel certain backroom's entities meaning it can save your life in a tense situation if you don't have a working weapon on your person. As you receive this fascinating lecture, you make a mental note to grab a few extra bottles of almond water before you leave. Wait, you want to leave? 
asks another one of the explorers. <laughs> Level 4 is one of the safer levels, especially here at Base Omega. It gets so much worse from here. Why would you want to descend to even more dangerous levels? You sigh and tell them it'd be hard to explain. You just have too many bad memories here. Nobody questions you further. While some get to the back rooms by accident, all those who came here by choice know better than to question another person's reasons. When you finish your meal, you ask a local guide at Base Omega to take you to the exit. You're ready to move on. A small group with flashlights and weapons leads you to a long, dark corridor not far from the base, terminating in a glowing green sign that seems to suggest an exit, even though you can't seem to understand the lettering. You gulp and walk forwards, wondering if this is right. Maybe you should listen to the other explorers. Maybe it would be best to just stay here, come what may. Surely the past is something you can come to terms with. Then again, if that was in the cards, would you have ever come to the back rooms at all? You take a deep breath and walk through the door. Welcome, explorer. You just keep surviving, don't you? How impressive. We still can't decide if that's a blessing or a curse yet, though perhaps a little time on level 6 will help clear up that confusion for you. Maybe it'll even be your light in the dark. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke, but you'll get it soon enough. You find your way into a hallway that looks like an entrance to a different place. You're sweating buckets with the metal tendrils of the boiler room behind you, belching steam and exuding ambient heat. You thank whatever deity or invisible force you believe in for the fact you were able to fill up your almond water supplies from the pipes, because if you hadn't, you surely would have sweated to death from dehydration. As you approach the hallway, you see a handwritten note pinned to the entrance. Of course, you've learned to heed little clues like this, so you unpin the note and give it a read. It says the following. A couple days ago, I saw someone rush out of the entrance to level six. Well, rush is a strong word. He limped, his left eye was missing, he was clutching his chest, and one of his legs was clearly broken horribly and trailing blood. He looked like he shouldn't have been alive, and from the sound of what he was saying, he didn't think so either. He said he'd been attacked. That much was obvious, but the nature of what attacked him was particularly unnerving to me. Whatever it was, it screamed at him to get away from it before pinning him to the ground and clawing at him. He said it felt like human fingers. He said it sounded like a human voice. I don't know where he is now. Some MEG operatives whisked him away to get his wounds treated. Maybe he lived, maybe he didn't. But seeing that guy come out of that level in that shape, I still think about it. There aren't supposed to be any entities, right? So picture this, you're in a dark room, you can't see, there's no noise. Hell, you don't even know what it's made out of. Imagine you're in there for a while, say five hours, and every so often you hear a little noise, like something's moving nearby. Wouldn't you start wondering what's going on? What might be going on around you that you don't know about? Wouldn't it start to eat at you a little after a while? Then by hour five, what would you do if something bumped into you? Even if it was a person, you wouldn't know that, would you? You wouldn't stop to consider what it might be. Rationality went out the window at hour three. You just need to survive. And maybe you'd walk away from it all, not knowing what horrible things you'd done in that darkness. Level six isn't dangerous because there's something there. It's dangerous because there's nothing there. Admittedly, you don't pay as much attention to the note as you probably should. While it's hard to admit, you've always been one of those people who kind of sees what they want to see in any given situation. After all, your galaxy brain idea to escape your crappy life was to invest all your energy into getting into this hellscape. And can you really say it improved anything? No. That's why, upon reading the note, your myopic takeaway is, wait, there are no entities on this level? That's awesome! After everything you've faced so far, you're beyond eager to jump into a new level with no actual threats. After all, you've got plenty of almond water and snacks. This should be a cakewalk. A wonderful little break from all the horrors you've dealt with. But when you actually enter, you begin to realize that your optimism for this place was a little misplaced. It is completely dark. Just utter, impenetrable Vantablack. You're in a universe that feels like it's never known light now. 
You pull out your most powerful flashlight and switch it on to shed a little light on the situation, metaphorically and literally, but the light seems to simply not travel. Even when you put your hands right in front of your face, you don't see them. You realize suddenly why there are no entities here. This place could never support any kind of life. Only darkness lives here. You realize that you're going to need to make your way through this place through touch alone. You reach out and feel the clammy, smooth walls. It occurs to you suddenly just how incredibly quiet this place is. It might be the most silent place you've ever been. You can hear your own heart beating, every inhale and exhale, the blood vessels pumping through your ears. You feel like you're on a level of the back rooms that somehow hadn't even loaded yet. You are the only asset in existence here. Your brain reorients to a new goal now. You need to get the hell out. So you begin moving through this oppressive blanket of darkness. All you can do is hug the walls and move forward, hoping that you don't trip over. That's why you need to move slowly too. If you tripped over and got turned around, you'd be irreparably lost in this place. And in this kind of darkness, they'd never even find your bones. Mm. What a nasty thought. So you try to push all these nasty thoughts out of your head and keep your eyes on the prize. You've survived every level up to now, even ones that were full of far more dangerous entities. You can survive this one too, right? But there's undeniably something about the darkness and the silence that takes on a frightening life of its own, an oppressive effect on your already fragile mental health. As the minutes, then hours pass, you begin to hear strange things in the dark, like scuttling sounds, footsteps. Was that someone else breathing? Oh no, oh no. The paranoia is starting to set in. But didn't that note say that there were no entities in here? It must be your mind playing tricks on you, right? But what if it isn't? Suddenly a terrible thought crosses your mind and flushes your system with a surge of icy dread. The back rooms are filled with tricksters. Windows that look normal but are ready to pull you to your death. Monsters disguised as puddles. Beasts that masquerade as humans by stealing and wearing their skin for God's sake. What's to say that a human being wrote that letter you read? Wouldn't that be the perfect cover for a malicious, intelligent entity? Writing a note basically telling you to let your guard down while it waits inside ready for the kill? Your calm composure plummets into a pit of anxiety and fear. Are you alone in here? You keep hearing those noises. Scuttling, chittering, whispers. What could it be? A six-foot cockroach with a switchblade or a giant unkillable spider who wants to drink your liquefied guts? Or something so much worse? Something truly unknowable. Something truly, cosmically, nightmarish. You're prepared to walk into some Lovecraftian fever dream, but instead something else somehow steps from the darkness, illuminated by some unknowable light source. And it isn't some eldritch beast, it's worse. It's your old boss, Mr. Bateman, the one who fired you from the last job you had before you decided to give it all up for the backroom's embrace. He's wearing that same nasty, hate-filled sneer from the day he called you into his office to give you the axe, sending you back into poverty. He rolls his eyes dismissively. So this is where you went after I canned your sorry ass, he says with a cruel chuckle. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. Of course you'd run away from responsibility into some strange dark crevice like the worthless little insect you are. <laughs> Good thing too. Better wasting away in here than adding to the surplus population back on Earth. <laughs> but now one thing, you're going to be as useless here as you were out there. Never forget that. You're at a loss for words. Your body is shaking with a mix of rage and despair. How can this be happening, you wonder? Then it hits you. This is a hallucination. You remember reading an article a couple years back about how the mind needs stimuli. And when it's deprived of that stimuli, it avoids total madness by making its own. First with subtle auditory hallucinations, and if it persists for long enough, detailed audiovisual hallucinations. Like, for example, imagining your boss berating you in the bowels of the back rooms. It's all just an illusion created by your own mind. Though admittedly, that doesn't make it hurt any less to hear it. You push forward through him into the darkness, diffusing him into vapor. But his cruel words and your knowledge that they originated in the depths of your own mind wound you. It's only a few hours of walking in the darkness. 
feeling along the cold concrete of the walls that you get another ghostly hallucinatory visit from the past you wish you could forget. It's Mrs. Newman, one of your 11th grade teachers from high school. She always failed you, berated you, and kept you behind after class. Just seeing her there, enshrined in light like whatever the opposite of an angel is, you can feel yourself breaking out into a cold sweat. Fears and anxieties you haven't felt in a decade are clawing their way up the walls of your heart and into your mind. You genuinely rather deal with monsters. She clears her throat like she always did, and says in that same shrill voice that always cut right through you. Well, 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 fancy seeing you here in this dark and dismal place. It suits you. This is always what I assumed the inside of your head looked like. God, I knew you wouldn't amount to much. You were always a lousy kid. But this? This is something else. I hope you enjoy it here, because I know for a fact that this is where you belong. You can feel the tears stinging your eyes. She's not telling you anything you didn't know, but that doesn't make it hurt even a smidgen less to hear it relitigated all over again. After all, that's why you're here, isn't it? Because you were so worthless and pathetic out there, you needed to run away from reality. You knew there was no place for you in that world, so you hoped against hope that there would be some small place for you in this one. Was there? You do what you've always tried to do, push through the pain and move on. Mrs. Newman shatters like glass and disappears as you walk through her. And just like that, you're in total darkness again, with silence as your only company. It is truly the loneliest place in the world, but that's fine. You lie to yourself, you're used to loneliness, but not this kind of loneliness. Part of you could even pray to run into a smiler just so you'd have something to keep you company. You'd take attempts on your life over more emotional torment right now. It just hurts too much. It's several hours after that wandering and wobbling through the darkness that you encounter them. The ones that you thought, that you hoped you would never see again. But there they are, emerging from the darkness. Your dear old mom and dad. Brows twisted in disapproval and eyes burning with the low, gnawing malice that you know they've always had for you. You feel yourself getting weak at the knees. You try to form the words, but nothing comes out. Your fear and horror are bone deep. They speak, somehow using one voice between them. You are nothing. A waste of space. We wish we never had you. You made both our lives worse. Again, nothing you didn't already believe, but to hear it puts you through agony. Every word lacerates you. You begin to sob and just keep walking, having no idea how much time passes. All you can hear is your own crying, bouncing off the walls of all these dark, narrow corridors and bouncing back to you, like a reminder of just how terrible you feel. This is what you came here to escape, so why can't you escape it here? Your thoughts are finally jogged when you almost trip and fall down the stairs. Wait, stairs? Does that mean a way out? It's hard to even quantify the relief you feel going down those stairs, following what inexplicably sounds like breaking tides of the ocean down below. But hey, you'll sure as hell take that over the oppressive silence of level 6. You've learned now that there are things far worse than monsters in the dark, suffocating halls of the back rooms. You take a deep breath and walk into the light. Welcome back, explorer. You look tired, and of course we don't blame you. You've had a long journey through the back rooms so far, and considering some of the terrifying things you've seen over the previous 11 levels, who can blame you for losing sleep? There aren't many places in this frightening dimension where you can comfortably take the weight off your feet and just relax. Do you think you're any safer here? <laughs> well, let's find out. Welcome to level 12, Explorer. We hope you enjoy your stay. As you enter the level, you notice how different it seems from so many of the others. In many cases, levels of the backrooms have been defined by their dizzying expansiveness. An office block that goes on for eternity. The endless winding streets of a city that feels more procedurally generated than constructed by human hands. A field misty and desolate, going on and on and on. But that's not this level. It's a white room, 
not especially large or small. The gleaming paint job on the wall almost induces a kind of snow blindness. It's an unnatural level of crispness and clarity, like walking into some surreal screensaver. There's a door on the far wall, but strangely, you notice that there isn't a door behind you. Don't worry, you're too well versed in the ways of the back rooms to be bothered by the logical inconsistency of that. You're instead focused on the chair and table sitting in the center of the room, as though you're preparing for a job interview and your interviewer just happened to be late. But you're not late, or early. Time is just sort of irrelevant in the back rooms. It's something you've always liked about the place. It'll never move on without you. It'll always move at the pace you do, even if the way it expresses that is by sending a horde of vicious bloodthirsty monsters after you while you run for your life. You have to take the good with the bad on these things, right? The first thing you do is approach the door, of course. It's never a bad idea to see if anything is waiting on the other side. With your free hand, you keep a tight grip on the handle of the revolver that's been with you for so many levels now. Anything that even thinks about coming after you will have six of your tiny metal friends to deal with, and they could move a hell of a lot faster than any entity you'd met so far. However, as you jiggle the door handle, you realize that the door is locked. Well, that figures. Several levels ago, that might have disturbed you or even led you to panic, but you're more of a hardened backrooms veteran these days. <laughs> Every level you've learned has its own logic, its own internal rhythm. If you wish to survive in the backrooms, you need to remain ever versatile. You need to analyze every level on its own terms, with no expectation that it may exist in the same parameters of other levels. You need to learn the rules anew each time and learn how to properly play them. That's why, given the only other objects in the room are a table and chair, you decide to take a load off and sip some tasty, rejuvenating almond water out of your canteen. You spend a moment thinking about how much it would suck to be stuck in the back rooms and have a nut allergy. Would that effectively spell doom for you? It's a frightening yet compelling question. It feels good to be sitting down and take it easy for once. You suffered horrors that would cleave apart the imagination and plunge the average person into a pit of gibbering madness. Not that you want to be dramatic about it, of course, but you've seen everything from eyes that can vaporize people with a glance, to giant underwater horrors, to evil conglomerations of pipe cleaners lurking around in a cursed hotel. You've lived about 30 horror movies worth of pure nightmares. You deserve a break, explorer. But there's a problem. It seems that whenever you take a moment to rest, all of the problems you were worrying about on the outside suddenly return. Your regrets about your family and friends, your fears about your worth and mortality, your doubts about whether you have an intrinsic meaning as a person. You breathe a sigh and shake your head, wishing all the thoughts in your head would settle down for a minute and let you rest. There is an eternal debate raging inside you. Which do you prefer? The nagging existential dreads from the old world that seem to be tattooed between the folds of your brain, or the immediate life or death threats that seem to lurk around every corner here in the back rooms. You can't help but laugh at the surreality of this. It's like asking, would you rather be kicked in the face or punched in the crotch? There's truly no winning. Your moment of self-pity is thankfully interrupted when someone else enters the room. This startles you. Much like your average gamer, it can be days or even weeks between moments where you encounter other human beings. And even in these moments, you can't help but wonder, friend or foe, reality or illusion? Are you a human being or just a skin stealer wearing one? The stranger who's entered the room is a tall, muscular woman with brown skin wearing a gray vest and camo pants. Her arms are well built and covered in old scars. Her black hair is drawn up into a ponytail she carries a large military-style backpack on her back with impressive ease. You think about going for your revolver again, but you intuit that if you do, it may end up getting pulled from your hands and shoved back into your mouth. Instead, you decide to be polite and greet this new stranger, welcoming her to level 12. She asks you if you're an entity that comes with the level, still seemingly slightly on guard. You stifle a laugh and tell her no, you're just a fellow explorer, waiting for something to happen. She smiles and comments that everybody is always waiting for something to happen, then introduces herself as Trish. Before you even have a chance to get up and offer her your chair, seeing as you've already been sitting down for a little while now, she slings her bag off her shoulder and takes a seat on the table. Already you can feel your worries from before being pushed to the wayside. 
Being here with another human, actually talking, is a welcome distraction from the horrors that have come before, and the horrors that will surely come after. Here with the achievements and the survival you've gained, you feel more confident talking to strangers. You've earned your place here. Trish asks how you got down here, and you recount the story we've been telling over the course of these videos. You hated your life on the outside. The reality is that there was no place for you in that world anymore, and that's a reality you had to face. After getting interested in the legends of the backrooms through reading about them on various niche internet forums, you decide to take the opportunity to escape into this strange new world and leave the old you behind. Because you were nothing special before. Hell, you were nothing, period. Here, you have the ability to reinvent yourself. While you tell the story, Trish just seems to listen and nod intently. There's a strangely profound calm to her, like someone who has seen it all and lets it all roll off her back. But it's been quite some time since you've encountered a good listener. So, maybe you overdo it, but really, it's just nice to have an opportunity to get it all off your chest, isn't it? When you're done, you feel self-conscious about talking about yourself so much. So you ask Trish about her story. She seems reluctant at first, but you say to her, who knows how long they'll be on this level. The backrooms is unpredictable like that. So the two of you might as well swap war stories to pass the time here. She chuckles when you use the phrase, war stories. Trish reaches into her vest and fishes out a pair of military dog tags with her thumb, before letting them fall limply against her chest. You were just politely curious about her story before, but now you just have to know. After some polite bugging, Trish finally relents and begins to tell the story of how she got to the back rooms. A few years back, she was one of the many soldiers deployed by the US military in Afghanistan. She'd seen terrible things during her deployment, friends and innocents dying in acts of stupid, unnecessary violence. Her second tour was almost at its end when her NCO told her and a small group of three others to investigate an abandoned house in a nearby village, where intel had reported suspicious activity. When her little group entered the building, they noticed that one wall seemed conspicuously darker than the others. Thinking logically, they assumed this might be a false wall hiding a secret room. The last thing they expected was to touch it and then all be no-clipped into the back rooms. Trish and her fellow soldiers had been making their way down through the back rooms ever since, much like you. It didn't take a genius to notice that only Trish was here without the three other soldiers she supposedly entered with. Thankfully, you didn't need to feel insensitive and ask what had happened to the others. Trish sighed and decided to surrender that information voluntarily. They'd lost their first, Colin, on level one, the endless warehouse. They'd missed level zero and no clipped right through a concrete wall. None of them had ever heard of the back rooms before, so this was an entirely new experience for them. This is why Colin, who'd been one of the bravest among them, was so easily ambushed by a group of dullers in the hallway who dragged him away and ate him alive. Trish shuddered. She'd never forget his screams. The second teammate she'd lost, Andreas, had been the most adventurous member of them all. He was the kind of guy who took chances. He'd go for the moonshot that everyone else was afraid to take. That's why when they were on level four, the abandoned office, he felt immediately drawn to the windows. And as someone who almost underwent the exact same fate, you know how this sad little story ends. Andreas prized open a window, hoping to crawl up and get some help. He was instead grabbed by a pair of huge, clawed hands, which dragged him into oblivion as he wailed on in horror. Trish breathes a little heavier as she's recounting the fate of her team, but you get the sense that this might be the only time she's ever gotten to tell someone about this. You know well enough yourself, it can be cathartic to share, even when the sharing is painful. The third and final member of her team was lost in level five. His name was Derek, and he'd been the youngest member of the team. His timidness had kept him safe until now, but it was clear that being trapped in this terrible place had been weighing on his mind. He stopped talking, developed a haunted thousand-yard stare. The horrors of this place were hollowing him out. In some moments, Trish had even noticed him talking to himself. Trish sighed and said, I think it noticed his weakness. It saw a vulnerability it could exploit, so of course it targeted him, targeted both of us. They were wandering through the luxurious halls of level five when they'd heard a strange voice in their head, deep and refined, but at the same time, it had a cruel, untrustworthy, serpentine quality. 
Trish knew immediately that these words were not to be trusted, but Derek was seduced by their content. I have a wonderful opportunity for you, the voice said. A way to not only escape, but to know kinds of power and pleasure that you've only dreamed of. All we need to do is make a little deal. By the time the legendary beast of level 5 manifested in front of them, it was already too late. Trish was brought up Catholic. She closed her eyes, feeling the dark power humming off of this cephalopod monstrosity. In her mind, she kept repeating, don't listen, this is the devil. But poor scared Derek had no such defenses. He accepted the deal and shook hands with the beast, and just like that, he was never seen again. Since then, Trish had been traveling alone traversing the back rooms level by level, just like you, and using her military knowledge and skills to survive in spite of all the odds being against her. Hearing this, you finally understand just how remarkable it is that you've survived this long. When Trisha's story is done, she thanks you. Nothing will ever make it better, but being able to talk about it all certainly helps. She wishes you luck on your travels, and you do the same for her. We hope you've enjoyed your time on level 12 and the brief respite from the horrors that they've given you, because very soon, it's all going to get oh so much worse. You haven't seen something so beautiful, have you, explorer? You walk out amidst the trees, bark smooth and black as pitch, lending them a kind of witchy elegance. It's a luscious red underfoot. The ground is carpeted with a mixture of red grass and crimson leaves that have fallen from the many long, interlocking branches up above. It's twilight. The sky is dark blue and dotted in white clusters of scattered stars. You can hear whispers in the air, the music of the forest. After being in so many terrifying places, you find yourself breathing so easy here. Could this really be level 14 of the back rooms? It seems impossible. It seems too perfect, too lovely to be true. But it is, Explorer. Welcome to level 14. Welcome to paradise. You keep walking, wanting to see more. Your eyes are practically watering with the majesty of it. The air smells like fresh cut grass. In the distance, a fat white moon hangs in the heavens somehow calming you with its rays. You feel like you're in some exquisite painting you may have seen once in a dream. Perhaps after all your suffering, this level is a reward, a reprieve, an oasis of light in the vast, cold desert of malice. As you walk, you notice more strange things on the ground. Are those bones distributed amongst the red leaves and grass? If they are, they look to be made of some shimmering crystal, diamond-studded. The moonlight shimmers off of them beautifully. What even is this place? You just keep walking, excited to see what you'll find next, when suddenly, a pang of hunger strikes you. It feels like a crude and ugly urge in a place as pristine as this. Just like the confusion and dread you feel when you reach for your backpack to find a snack, only to realize that somehow, you're not wearing your backpack anymore. How could this be? Your food, your supplies, your weapons, how could they all be? Then you breathe in another lungful of that clean, crisp, slightly perfumed air, and your worries are chased from your mind. It's fine. You'll deal with this one way or another. You haven't survived 15 levels of the back rooms by not being resourceful. Whatever is lost can be found again. It's just a matter of being patient and taking everything in due course. But still, you're hungry. You'll need to solve that. You keep walking through the strange woods of this fairy tale paradise, searching high and low for something that can sustain you. That's when you happen upon a dew-kissed apple, laying on the ground amidst the falling leaves. You've never seen a more delicious-looking apple. Carefully, you pick it up and study it. A marvelous specimen that feels like it should be sitting on a teacher's desk in a cartoon. It's plump and shapely, with deep, rich skin that shines somehow even redder than the undergrowth. Your mouth waters just looking at it. You feel your stomach rumble and decide it's time to indulge. You sink your teeth into the apple and eat a sizable chunk, 
It's every bit as delectable as the apple's appearance would suggest. You feel so good. What is it about this place that makes you feel so calm, so content? Even back in the old world, that was never you. Anxiety ate at you like a pit full of hungry rats. You had trouble sleeping every night because you'd lay awake in bed, staring at the ceiling, being harried by your worries, doubts, and fears. It was debilitating. You couldn't sleep, but there were so many days you couldn't even get out of bed. You were terrified of the world, even before you entered this realm filled with nightmares and monsters. You always had some invisible force kneeling on your chest, making it harder to breathe. But here on level 14 of the back rooms, you can breathe so easy. You drink in the air. You want to get drunk on this place. Some part of you never wants to leave. But you also want to know why you don't want to leave. What's going on here? You keep walking through the seemingly enchanted forest until you happen upon a clearing. A vast, flat plain carpeted with the same red grass. And there are people here. Happy, smiling people, all dressed in white robes. It's a wholesome, pastoral setting. People dance around a maypole. Others sit at a long table feasting and chatting happily. It's the most truly content you've seen other human beings in the back rooms. The air sings with the most beautiful music, but you can't see anyone out there playing it. Is it really out there? Or just in your head? You can't quite tell. Suddenly, some of the dancing people notice you and begin to approach. They're smiling so warmly, their arms extended. You feel so welcomed. You hardly even notice it, but you're beginning to smile. It's the first time in as long as you can remember that you feel like you belong somewhere. The people of level 14 invite you into their clearing to join them in their revelry. They speak about this place with the same kind of reverence that you feel in your heart. They tell you that they'd had terrible experiences in the rest of the back rooms. They'd lost friends and loved ones to the monsters lurking on the many levels. They'd been chased by smilers and dullers, attacked by beasts in the deep, dark waters, and tortured mentally by the beast of level 5. Level 14 was an oasis, a reprieve from the horrors. Why would they ever want to leave? And their words, they resonate with you. You've experienced a lifetime of being unsafe. Is it really so wrong, so selfish, to want to take it easy for whatever time you have left? This place seems so nice. Don't you want to see the rest of it? Don't you want to make a nice little life for yourself here? One of the smiling robed people invites you over to a nearby dinner table. It is a beautiful feast with various roast birds, apples, glass bowls full of delicious-looking berries, succulent sliced ham, and a variety of desserts, from elaborately molded jello to bowls of warm, delicious custard. The first apple was certainly tasty, but you couldn't be more eager to partake in this incredible meal. You take a seat, one seemingly reserved for you, and someone passes you an ornate metal goblet full of a fruity-smelling drink. You drink deeply. It is divine, transcendent. When you place your goblet down on the table, one of the others leans in with a jug and fills it back up. You're surrounded by so many grinning faces, all welcoming you, all wanting you to be here. It's such a warm, loving feeling. Is this place heaven? But now, it's time to eat. You and the others congregating around the table begin to fill your plates cutting away parts of chicken, turkey, quail, liberating slices of ham, grabbing vegetables, and pouring on decadent sauces. After weeks or perhaps even months of energy bars and thermoses full of almond water, to eat real food like this feels like the greatest luxury. You eat ravenously. You want to take your fill, just like all the others. That's when you see one of the people across the table making eye contact with you, smiling. It's a slightly older woman, perhaps in her mid-fifties. Maybe you're projecting, but she seems oddly motherly to you. Are you glad to be here, explorer? She asks. You swallow your mouth full of chicken, washing it down with a goblet of that tasty, fruity liquid. You nod, smiling politely in return. Good, she says. You're meant to be here. This is paradise. 
It's a beautiful, perfect place. A warm blanket, a soft, protective membrane that keeps us safe from the horrors of this universe. It is kindness and abundance. It is our mother and father. We will stay here, and we will receive its bounty. It is a little eerie, but you decide to continue smiling and nodding. The food is good, the vibes are immaculate. You don't intend to ruin anything. After all, who could blame someone for going a little loopy in the back rooms? It is a stressful place to be, to say the least. Perhaps once, this might have bothered you. Maybe seeing something that seems a little eerie like that, a little off, would have made you feel nervous. You've learned to notice little things in the back rooms, but here, you don't feel that same sense of unease. It's as though, on this level, your brain is being flattened. That's when you notice another apple sitting on the table. It looks just like the one you found in the forest. So red, juicy, and plump. Ignoring everything else, you pick it up and take a big bite. Again, that delicious flavor cascades down your throat. You chew for a moment, savoring the taste, when suddenly, something feels off. It isn't so much the taste, but the texture. You feel like something is moving against your tongue. What the hell is that? You grab a napkin off the table and spit into it. What you see within horrifies and disgusts you. A blob of dark brown mush filled with wriggling maggots. Shocked, you turn and look at the apple you just took a bite out of. It looks rotten and withered, covered in furry mold with browning flesh within. It's alive with hundreds of maggots. You drop it onto the table with a horrified splat. What's wrong? The older woman asks. You look up and gasp. The table is completely different now. The food is rotten and rancid, covered in mold, hungry flies, and nasty, wriggling creatures. The formerly pristine white tablecloth looks like used toilet paper. The robes of the people around the table are equally tarnished. The revelers, the people of level 14, are filthy and emaciated. The grime on them looks almost bone deep. Some of them are chewing on the old corpses of death rats. Others smile with chattering black teeth. There is no music anymore. The air smells like rot. The calm dissipates instantly. You open your mouth to let out a horrified scream, but before the sound can begin, everything is back to normal. It's as though a switch has been flipped. The food looks delicious again. There's music in the air. All the other diners around the table look normal once more, but now you've drawn attention to yourself. They're all looking at you, smiling. That sense of calm is trying to enter your mind again, but this time, it doesn't feel like a guest. It feels like an intruder. This level is trying to sedate you, to numb your perceptions, to keep you from noticing the truth of the matter. It's like you're in Plato's cave and you've just learned the meaning of shadow. What is seen cannot be unseen. You turn from the table and vomit onto the red grass, drawing even more attention to yourself. Is something wrong, explorer? The old woman asks. You don't want to answer her. You want to get out of this monstrous place. Without saying a word, you climb out of your seat and begin to run back towards the woods. You can hear the people in the white robes rising up from their seats to pursue you, but you don't have time to look back. Not if you want to live. And despite yourself, you now know that you really, really do want to live. Life is full of mixed blessings like that. You keep running back into the woods. They still seem beautiful for a moment. The red grass and leaves, the gorgeous dark trees, the shimmering crystalline bones. You blink for a moment, and momentarily, everything changes. The trees and branches are dead, rotten, and wilting. The ground is littered with decaying corpses all laying face down. The whole environment stinks of death, so thick and overpowering you feel the urge to vomit. You look over your shoulder and see the filthy people with soiled robes and hungry eyes sprinting through the forest after you. And lucky for you, their malnutrition leaves them without energy. Soon enough, they fall behind, fading into the darkness. Another blink, and everything is normal again. But you know what's really here. For as long as you live, you'll know. Welcome back, explorer. Here we are primed and ready for another adventure in the great unknown of the back rooms. I suppose it's easy to imagine your significant 
when you're the only living one wandering through endless cramped hallways filled with the long since dead. How about we change things up a little today? No claustrophobic man-made creations, no suffocating passages or dusky suburbs or vast yet oddly anonymous cities. Instead, let's return to nature. It's perhaps been a bit too long since you've touched some grass, don't you think, explorer? Welcome to level 16. Make sure to breathe in the fresh air while you can. You've no clipped into another strange and alien place. Well, not entirely alien, just alien to what you've seen so far. You've watched enough David Attenborough documentaries about the Amazon rainforest to recognize the lush bounty of biodiversity sprawling out all around you. The towering ancient trees, whose branches and leaves form a dense canopy overhead, pierced by spears of early morning light that fall upon you like the many thick green vines dangling from above. Mist hangs in the air. How can it simultaneously be so humid and yet carry that distinctive early morning chill? Before you, the undergrowth is thick and fertile. Dead leaves, sprawling networks of roots, wet brown mud with the consistency of clay. The only thing that seems unusual about it is the lack of insects and small lizards or snakes skittering and slithering around. The back rooms, after all, has its own unique flora and fauna. Things might appear similar to the world you've always known here, but nothing will ever be quite the same. Even 17 levels in, that still takes some time to adjust to. After all, no matter how acclimated to this world you become, you will never be a native here. Still, you continue your journey, observing a nearby flowing river and the great willowy tree leaning down into the water, contemplating grabbing a vine and swinging across it while bellowing like Tarzan. It's not like anyone would see you here, right? No point hanging on to something as petty as shame in this world. As you run after and try to catch some falling leaves like an excitable child, it begins to dawn on you just how much of the life you had before was dictated by worrying about the thoughts and opinions of people you never respected or even really liked. How many years had you wasted trying to impress the people whose thoughts disgusted you? What a funny way to live, explorer. Funny indeed. Soon you come upon something interesting. The first sign of something man-made here in this world of otherwise unspoiled natural beauty. Something metallic is sticking out of the lower trunk of a huge broad tree. As you get closer, you make the assumption that perhaps it's a machete or a hatchet left behind by some previous wanderer who is hacking through the branches and vines near here. But as you get closer, you see that strangely, no, this isn't the case. The man-made instrument sticking into the tree is an ice axe, the kind someone might use to help them scale a mountain. You then notice that this highly out-of-place instrument was used to carve a brief but frantic message into the tree's bark. The message reads, Beware, it's all going to change. An offering as ominous as it is vague. You've played enough video games in your time to know that you're clearly meant to take the ice axe. You don't know what you'll need it for yet, but you're absolutely certain you'll need it at some point. If not on this level, than on some other. All the objects you discover in the back room seems to find their own uses eventually. You slide the ice axe through one of your belt loops and move on, pondering what it's all going to change could mean. Your pondering is interrupted by an icy breeze. Suddenly, you find yourself shivering. How strange. Why would you be shivering in the middle of a dense, humid rainforest? A minute ago, you felt like you were starting to overheat from the exertion of moving. Now you're hugging your arms around your shoulders, teeth chattering, trying to retain what little warmth you have left. In that moment, the sinister prophecy carved into that tree begins to come true all around you. Trees are sucked into the ground. Thankfully, the message put you on edge, made you alert exactly as intended. You dodge the branches as they're pulled into the earth, knowing you would have been crushed by them if you didn't. 
The mist hanging in the air is replaced by swirling white snowdrifts that sting your skin. You blink and the jungle from before is gone. You're standing in the middle of a vast and unforgiving frozen tundra, leading off for miles towards the sheer cliffs of icy mountains. Just like the warning had said, it has all changed. You don't feel like you're in the Amazon anymore. You're in the Arctic, and you can feel the cold in your bones. You keep moving. You need to move to preserve at least some of the heat inside you. If not, you're doomed to become a part of this frozen landscape. An explorer's sickle, staring forever out of the ice in some slack-jawed horror, like some primitive dead troglodyte. <laughs> oh, but don't feel bad, explorer. If that does happen, at least you can be an entertaining little landmark for whoever comes next. We like to be positive here at Backrooms Explained. As you move over an icy hill, rubbing your arms and shivering so hard you can feel your bones rattling deep within, you feel a profound sense of regret that you didn't bring a thicker coat, or at least those nice mittens you bought last year, but hadn't yet gotten around to using. But right now, you can't get a coat. You can, however, get a plan. And a plan might be able to save you. Might, mm -hmm. of course. Let's not get our hopes up too much. Your eyes turn to the nearest icy mountain as the frigid howling winds around you make your ears ache. If you can get over there and find some kind of cave, you can at least shield yourself from the wind, and perhaps make some temporary shelter or build a fire to stop yourself getting hypothermia or frostbite. It's far from a safe bet, but right now, it's the best bet you have. Stealing yourself, you put as much energy as you can into getting to that frozen mountain. Fortune, it seems, really does favor the brave, because as you reach the mountain, you do indeed find a cave to secrete yourself into. It's hardly warm and cozy, but it's a respite from the lashing icy winds outside, and that makes it feel like a paradise in a pinch. You pull out your canteen, and take a long sip of almond water to revitalize yourself, feeling your breathing steady slightly. Now you need to figure out if anything you have on you can make a decent fire. This whole situation has taught you a lot about the values of carrying around a bunch of dry sticks and fire lighters in case the world around you abruptly becomes a horrific frozen wasteland. You really never know when this kind of situation is going to come up, do you? As you sit there shivering and wondering if maybe freezing to death isn't that bad, after all there are so many monsters that could horribly kill you down here, you hear a strange hissing noise and feel something odd falling onto your head. Instinctively, you reach your stiff frozen fingers up to your hair to feel just what fell into it. More snow, perhaps? But no, it doesn't feel cold. It feels like something coarse and rough and capable of getting everywhere. You look at your hand, of course, it's sand. Shocked, you look up and see cracks forming on the roof of the icy cave above you, and more sand comes pouring out of the cracks. The whole mountain is rumbling around you like an earthquake. Driven purely by your backroom's honed survival instincts, you spring up and sprint out of the cave before it can implode on you, crushing you with its immense weight. But by the time you're out of the ice cave, you're not in the frozen tundra world you ran in from. You're in a vast, scorching desert, the kind of sandy hellscape that would sizzle a cactus to death. The sun seemingly right above you beats down with tremendous force. The mountains of ice that once dotted the landscape are instead replaced with monstrous sand dunes. You're expecting a giant horrifying worm monster to be attracted by the vibrations of your footsteps and spring out of the ground to devour you. That would almost be preferable to the more mundane but upsetting demise of being roasted to death beneath the red hot sun like a slab of cheap beef. You sigh and begin to walk again. You return to the old maxim, if you walk for long enough, you simply have to get somewhere, don't you? Personally, we think it's very nice that you believe that, because, well, we appreciate your optimism. We won't tell you that. Technically speaking, not all backrooms levels obey the typical rules of the space-time continuum, so you can actually keep walking and not move anywhere at all. But please, don't think about that right now. 
Just stay calm and happy. As happy as you can be while feeling like a fried egg. You pull out your canteen again and begin chugging almond water, hoping that one of its rejuvenating properties is preventing this diabolical sun from giving you a severe melanoma. When you're done drinking, you feel how threateningly light the canteen is now, and you begin to worry about your almond water supplies. It is a cruel irony, isn't it? It's been one of the most dangerous and hostile levels so far, and as far as you know, there aren't even any aggressive entities here. The environment itself is trying to kill you. You sigh, and foolishly, we might add, decide to say out loud, at least it can't get any hotter, I guess. And as if on cue, you feel the ground rumbling beneath you, and regret ever opening your big, stupid mouth. That's when a jet of fire blasts from the ground in front of you, just barely missing you as you stumble backwards. You lose your footing and fall back, but instead of your back landing relatively harmlessly against a pile of sand, you instead feel the discomfort of hard, jagged rocks whacking you in the spine. What fresh hell is being delivered onto you now, explorer? The only way to find out is to look and see. You rise shakily to your feet, suddenly feeling an even more intense heat all around you. The sand is gone, replaced by a huge vista made from jet black volcanic rock, cut apart by rivulets of glowing molten lava. Everywhere you look, Massive volcanoes, belching great spouts of ash and leaking more lava down their sides, dominate the skyline. You're in the middle of some primordial nightmare, born of fire and rock. A proto-Earth, before the proto-conditions for life even form. The air you breathe here feels <laughs> thick and soupy. You don't currently have the emotional bandwidth to be horrified by this situation. Instead, you just stare blankly across the expanse of lava world and say to yourself, eh, this might as well happen. All you can really do is shrug and keep moving. If you walk for long enough, you will reach some kind of destination. And there has to be an exit around here somewhere. You know, the back rooms is a big place. Some believe it's almost infinite. With an ever-growing list of strange and mysterious levels to traverse and survive. It goes without saying that it would be frankly impossible to see all of the back rooms through one set of eyes. Take, for example, the enigmatic levels. The enigmatic levels often have more obscure entrances than the main levels, as well as more bizarre and often threatening content, which if you're a connoisseur of the main levels, you know is really saying something. There are plenty of enigmatic levels already documented, with all theories pointing to the fact that there are more out there, still waiting to be found. Thankfully, we're not alone on this journey. We've got one of the many poor, tortured souls that populate the back rooms here to help accompany us through our journey into liminal perdition. Meet Trish. Trish was a soldier working for the US military, the only survivor of a four-person squad, who accidentally got trapped in the back rooms during their second deployment in Afghanistan. War is, obviously, no picnic, but the back rooms offers horror that our native world could never muster up. Even in the most terrifying of circumstances, Trish's experience with the military has given her strength, skills, and equipment that the average civilian wouldn't have access to. But what good will that do in the face of monsters that human beings have never before encountered? Or at least, encountered and survived? We can try to find the answer to these questions today, in the place where children's dreams and every adult's nightmare comes to life. That wholesome, nostalgic pizza restaurant from the early 80s. Barnaby Bunn's Fun Emporium. Where they put the fun into funeral, and the laughter into slaughter. Good luck, Trish. We hope you can find your way home. <laughs> Our story begins in the desolate gray hallways of Level 4. The abandoned office, where Trish has been wandering for hours. It's been one of the less dangerous and traumatic levels that Trish has traversed so far. So on some level, she's simply grateful that she hasn't been chased by some horrific grinning monster today. That being said, 
she hasn't had the good luck of encountering any of the human settlements on this level to replenish her supplies or refill her social batteries. She wants to believe that there needs to be something worthwhile on this level, other than desolate bullpens and broken plastic office chairs from 1999. Then, she gets lucky. She happens upon an elevator with a strange logo printed on the doors. A cartoon of a grinning pink bunny with wide, staring eyes. Underneath, the words Barnaby Bun's Fun Emporium are printed with the tagline, It's Bun for the Whole Family. How strange. It's the last thing she expects to see in this nightmare reality. Trish ponders for a moment. Why does this feel so incredibly familiar to her? It induces the most peculiar feeling of deja vu, a half-formed memory. She needs to know more. And after all, any direction out of this godforsaken office feels like a positive development for her. So she presses the button, waits patiently as the door opens, and steps inside. She forces a smile as the doors close in front of her, and the elevator hums as it begins to descend. This would, of course, be a terrible mistake. But who are we to judge? Soon enough, Trish reaches the bottom, and the elevator doors slide open, revealing another dimly lit hallway with the walls painted in slightly fading primary colors. She steps out, remaining silent, carefully taking in the finer details of her surroundings. The black and white check floor, the occasional discarded party streamer, the archaic looking security camera staring down from above at the open elevator at her. She wonders where the feet of that security camera leads to, but accepts the fact that this question will probably never receive a satisfactory answer. The elevator doors close behind her, emblazoned in that same Barnaby Bun's Fun Emporium logo. The air smells like old pizza, dirt, and sweat. Not the most appealing combination of sensory inputs, but Trish goes further nonetheless. She unslings the M4 carbine rifle from her shoulder and holds it at the ready, hoping that she won't need to use it, because she only has a couple more mags and a few loose rounds in her backpack. Every single bullet needs to count, or she'll be fresh out soon enough. Still, this whole place evokes uncertain memories within her sharp, focused mind. As she turns the corner into the main hall of the building, she sees a variety of multicolored plastic benches lining the room, covered in garish plates filled with half-eaten pizza and snacks. There are still streamers and party hats laying around, and balloons that should have wilted or popped long ago still float. It's a gimmicky kid's pizza chain, like Chuck E. Cheese and their myriad imitators. They were more common than cockroaches in the 80s and early to mid-90s, and were also likely home to plenty of cockroaches, too. That same grinning pink rabbit, presumably Barnaby, is painted all over the walls in a variety of strange, warped fashions that border on surrealism. It gives Trish the creeps on a deep, primal level. And in that moment, she remembers. It all comes back. It was 1989, the last year this place was open, and she was five years old. Her mom and dad were in the middle of a heated divorce and the two of them were competing for her affection, while simultaneously having less money than ever. All the stress and tension she was feeling came to a head when she was taken to a Barnaby Bun's Fun Emporium for her sixth birthday party. She hated the food and all the loud, blaring music. It was an all-around assault on the senses. So when whatever hapless employee who wore the mascot suit was forced to come and sing her a public domain happy birthday song, she broke down into sobbing tears of mortal terror. It took over an hour to console her. Even now, she shudders at the thought of that damn mascot costume. Its cheapness lent it a kind of unsettling jank that even top-end horror movies couldn't replicate. Thank God this awful place shut down. That gives Trish pause. She tries to recollect. Why did this place close down again? There was some kind of scandal, some illicit behavior from the owners. She remembers her mom being extremely evasive around it. Trish continues to sneak slowly through the tacky old restaurant. She's no dummy. She's not making a sound, not doing anything that might give away her position. If someone, or worse, 
something is in here. She wants to maintain the element of surprise. Given some of the beasts she's already faced down here, it's likely that element might be the only feather in her cap. The place seems abandoned, so it makes her jump when she notices some figures huddled around a table in the corner. Are those kids? She needs to help them get out of this nightmare. But as she approaches, she comes to the half-relieving, half-disturbing realization that these aren't children at all. They're decrepit old mannequins, dressed in ratty children's clothes, one of which looks like a homemade sweater, with a slightly malformed T-Rex stitched into it. Just looking at it gives Trish the creeps. She steps away, doubling her caution, and begins searching the rest of the building, her M4 still drawn. She passes through a broken down arcade, the boxes coated in dust, and many of the screens smashed in or covered with an out-of-order sign. One of the arcade boxes, a dilapidated game called Polybius, has the words Game Over scrawled over the glass. Trish begins to feel a weight on her chest, as though some invisible, oppressive force has been following her, slowly growing in power and influence. She needs to keep moving, or something terrible will happen to her. Trish inches past the filthy-looking ball pit, which she remembers freaking her out as a kid. Back then, she imagined it secretly being full of snakes, gators, and sharks. Now, she pictures it being full of dirty needles and diseases that nobody has contracted since 1926. Disgusting. Eventually, she finds her way to a discreet door labeled Staff Only. Perhaps this would be the manager's office. If there are answers anywhere in this terrible place, they're here. With a little bit of careful jimmying, the lock comes open soon enough, leading her into a room that looks like it hasn't been inhabited by human beings in decades. The air is thick with dust and dead skin particles. The light is dim and murky. The room is dominated mostly by a large metal desk, every drawer locked. But what attracts Trish's interest is the manager's choice of wall decals. The wall is practically plastered with missing posters, featuring faded, smiling pictures of people of all ages. Trish gulps, the narrative suddenly forming in her mind. One of the many missing posters draws her eye. House Daniger, a young boy wearing a homemade sweater with a T-Rex sewn into it. Exactly like the shirt Trish had seen on one of the mannequins earlier. Trish decides she'd much rather hang around the abandoned office on level 4 than spend another second in this absolute nightmare. But the second she steps out of the office to make her way back to the elevator, she realizes that this new mission might be easier said than done. Because she's not alone on this level, and the level's other occupant is standing in the shadows a few feet in front of her. Trish, meet Barnaby Bunn, your worst nightmare. Well, this entity isn't Barnaby Bun per se, but it certainly looks like a Barnaby Bun mascot suit. The same one tied into Trish's childhood trauma, given a life of its own. This life-sized bad news bunny stares at Trish with its big cartoonish eyes and tilts its head menacingly. Maybe it's a little gung-ho of her, but Trish drops to one knee and opens fire with her M4, peppering the freaky mascot with bullets. Immediately, Barnaby begins to advance, taking confident, powerful strides, seemingly utterly unfazed by the barrage of ballistics. When Barnaby closes the distance in a matter of seconds, Trish almost feels her heart stop. With seemingly impossible speed, Barnaby wrenches the rifle from Trish's grip and snaps it in the middle like a twig, before casting it aside and grabbing Trish by the throat. She feels his grip stronger than steel around her throat as he lifts her clear off the ground, still staring impassively with his big cartoony eyes, as though this little interaction means nothing to him. Trish can feel her world going dark. She needs to do something quick, or she's going to die in the decaying memory of a crappy old pizza restaurant. Her adrenaline kicks into overdrive, and she balls her fist punching Barnaby in his big, sneering head again and again. He shows no sign of pain, 
but little by little, his grip loosens, causing Trish to fall back to the ground, coughing and spluttering. Now's her chance. Thinking fast, with her rifle destroyed, she reaches into her bag and pulls out a grenade. In one fluid motion, she pulls out the pin, stuffs it into the void behind Barnaby's buck teeth, and makes a mad dash for the hall. Seconds later, she hears an almighty explosion and looks behind her to see that the rest of the store has been consumed by an inferno. Smoke billowing out into the hallway after her. It seems as though the whole building has been destroyed. But then, she hears footsteps getting closer and closer until Barnaby Bunn, utterly unharmed, walks out of the flames. Trish knows now that there's no point in even trying to fight him. Instead, she turns and runs for her life towards the elevator, hearing his footsteps behind her. She hammers on the call button and turns to see that Barnaby is only a few feet away. When the doors finally open, and she practically leaps in and hits the button for level four. But why isn't the elevator going up? Once again, she sees Barnaby Bunn sliding his paws in between the doors and prying them open like some movie maniac. Trish screams, and with all her strength, delivers a booted kick to Barnaby's face, causing him to tumble back just long enough for the doors to close and the elevator to begin its ascent. Trish collapses against the back of the elevator, breathing heavily, glad to be alive, but once again, shocked and terrified by just how bad things can get down here. Little does she know, it's going to get much, much worse. Trish, the ex-soldier who'd been trapped in the back rooms with her now deceased squad, was having a hell of a week, with a heavy emphasis on hell. Not long ago, she'd narrowly escaped a bestial bunny in the bowels of Barnaby Bunn's Fun Emporium, one of the back room's many sinister enigmatic levels. Thankfully, with quick thinking, she'd been able to narrowly avoid her death at the cost of her assault rifle. Little did she know, she was about to stumble into another enigmatic den of horrors very, very soon. Escaping Barnaby Bunn's fun emporium had brought her back to the world of mindless gray corporate tedium that is level four, the abandoned office, where she'd long since gotten sick of the drab carpeting and dusty old partitions. She needed to get out of here and hopefully access an area in this strange new dimension that was a little more hospitable. Falling back on her military training, she decided to go about this as methodically as possible, checking off the area in sectors until she found a viable way out. It'd take a thorough search through every hallway, conference room, office space, and maintenance closet, but by God, she would get it done. One thing she got sick of seeing over and over again was office chairs. The same cheap plastic three-wheeler abominations that looked almost designed to collapse and injure their user the nanosecond after the warranty expires. They were about as common as dust particles in level four, and every single one of them was identical. So much so that many of them simply blended into the background. That's why, when she saw the special chair, it truly did capture her attention. Bear in mind, when we say special, we don't necessarily mean good. In fact, to Trish, the chair looked like a glitch that you might see in an old video game. It had several wheels sticking out at odd angles, and its back seemed both oddly long and curved at the top. How peculiar. For some reason, Trish felt the need to get closer. How would a person actually sit on this thing? She was determined to find out. That's why she made the mistake of touching this strange glitched chair, then blinked and saw everything had turned yellow. Suddenly, on every side she could see gaudy yellow wallpaper and feel damp carpet squelching beneath her boots. The air was filled with an irritating buzz that felt oddly like insects crawling all over her skin. While she didn't know it, Trish had no clipped into level zero, which is, for many, 
the most common point of entry into the back rooms as a whole. She would spend hours wandering these putrid yellow halls, feeling her sense of unease grow as she came to realize that there may not be a door to anywhere here. But Trish was no slouch. She'd always believed that if you can't find a door, the next best thing to do would be to make one yourself. She reached into her hefty backpack and pulled out her handy entrenching tool, a small fold-up shovel that came in extremely handy in times like this. She used it to help dig out a section of that ugly wet carpet and see the floorboards underneath. Now she was getting somewhere. There had to be some kind of logic to this place. There had to be somewhere above and somewhere below. And all that stood between her and it was a few brittle old floorboards. There'd be no challenge here. Trish smashed through a section of the floor with all her might until it gave away entirely, revealing a hidden chamber underneath. Perfect. There was no light down there, but she'd take no light over the endless buzz of the yellow halogen above her head in level zero. Trish took a chunk of wood from the broken boards and dropped it down into the hole, where it gave a clunk a moment later, so at least she wouldn't be leaping down into oblivion. She sighed and took the plunge down into the dark. Trish felt the strain in her knees as she hit the ground. Hard concrete. And after a few seconds of darkness, new light flickered on, revealing the plain industrial room she was now standing in. Trish didn't have the tools to know it, but she'd just descended into a new enigmatic level, one appropriately nicknamed The Basement. Surely nothing will go wrong down here. Still, Trish was at least happy to be somewhere that felt familiar. She'd been in countless basements like this throughout her life at different family homes. Compared to the other nightmares she'd faced in the back room so far, this was positively homey. This kind of baseline comfort made her feel ready to explore further and find out what exactly was happening here. She approached a nearby door and opened it up, seeing a set of eerie stairs leading down into what looked like a flooded sub-basement, filled with foul-smelling, murky water. While it obviously wasn't Trish's first instinct to go diving in the bilge water below, she'd also developed a kind of in-for-a-penny-in-for-a-pound mentality, where anything less than being stalked by an unkillable homicidal bunny rabbit really didn't seem like that much of a problem. Curiosity was pushing her onwards now, and dragging her down to the depths below. After stealing herself, she began walking down the stairs towards the cold embrace of the dark waters. Trish found herself in an expansive dark tunnel with a curved roof overhead, stretching into the distance like some disused train tunnel or giant sewer pipe. The only way to go was forward, so that's what she did, wading through deathly cold waters that went up to her lower ribs. It was so dark down in the tunnel that she needed to make sure of a tactical flashlight that she kept in her backpack, just to make sure she wasn't waiting around in circles. The water itself was dark almost to the point of being impenetrable. Something about it made her feel profoundly nervous. But she pushed down the feelings and kept moving. Panic would only lead to death down here. As minutes eventually turned to hours, Trish just kept waiting. There was a mostly comforting, uneventful rhythm to it, until her concentration was broken by something brushing up against her leg under the water, sending a full-body shudder coursing up through her bones. What the hell was that? Some random piece of debris floating in the water that just happened to brush up against her leg? Or was it something alive? A fish? A leech? Or fingers? She shook her head, trying to dismiss the thoughts and keep moving. Impossible things have happened down here, but there's no point in getting all paranoid just yet. She'd save fear for the kind of evidence that truly warranted it. A wise decision, because such evidence would appear soon enough. Not that she had any idea, of course. Soon, wading became swimming as the water got deeper. Trish's whole body was practically immersed in the water now. She was just lucky that she happened to be a strong swimmer or all the equipment she was lugging around probably would have stopped her in her tracks. Still, the further she swam, the more she thought about that sensation of something brushing up against her leg. 
Like most things underwater, it felt cold and slimy, but something was different. Even though the sensation had long passed, she still felt a strange, lingering sting on the ankle it had touched. Needless to say, when she finally found somewhere to climb out of the water, she felt tremendously relieved. It was a narrow set of stone stairs into what appeared to be an even narrower hallway. Far from ideal, sure, but she'd have given anything to finally be dry after this impromptu swimming session. That relief quickly dissipated when she climbed out and saw her ankle. Exactly where she felt something brush up her skin and the subsequent lingering sting, Trish saw four light scratches, configured as though they were left by the fingernails of a grasping hand. Was there something, someone, beneath the water? The thought was terrifying, and as if on cue, when Trish looked out into the waterlogged tunnels she'd just swam in from, she saw something in the distance. What might have been a dark figure cresting out of the water, slightly further than the light of her flashlight could reach. It didn't move, it just stood there, as though it was watching. Then Trish blinked, and it was gone, reduced to ripples on the water's surface. A lot of what was happening here didn't make sense, but Trish knew one thing. She needed to keep moving right now, or something terrible was going to happen to her. Basements are creepy at the best of times, but this was on a whole other level, an enigmatic level specifically. Her body freezing and her clothes heavy and waterlogged, Trish rose up the uneven stairs and squeezed herself into the narrow hallway that led her in the opposite direction of the water she'd swam in from. The corridors were lit by archaic old halogen bulbs fizzing softly up above. At least up here, she had some hope of drying out, even though for now she was shivering from the intense cold her wet clothes were giving her. She was dripping onto the stony ground, trying to avoid getting scraped against the walls. That's when she felt it, the prickle of the hairs on the back of her neck. That primal, instinctual part of her brain just sensed something lurking behind her. And, almost automatically, her head whipped around to see it. In an important reminder as to why you should always trust your instincts, Trish saw what had set her off immediately, standing maybe 20 feet away from her, down in the direction she'd just been walking from. Just seeing it there knocked the breath from her chest. The only way she could describe the thing standing back there would be a rotting corpse, standing and watching without eyes. Its skin was gray, mottled, and loose, with long, gnarled yellow fingernails. It looked like dead bodies she'd seen on the news before, or in true crime documentaries, where the victim had been left underwater for a few weeks before finally being dredged out. And there it was standing and waiting, as though the second Trish looked away, it had moved towards her. But Trish was wrong about that. This corpse wouldn't wait. After a moment of silence, the zombie-like creature rushed at her. Thanks to years of training, Trish was able to draw her sidearm and fire off several rounds into the shambling nightmare. The sudden shock caused it to stumble, leaking thick black water out of the bullet holes. This seemed to slow it down, but not meaningfully harm it. Still, that was probably the best Trish could hope for. While the waterlogged zombie was stunned, she turned and ran as fast as she could in the opposite direction, sustaining more cuts and bruises on her shoulders from the narrow walls. She could hear the wet slapping of the zombie's footsteps behind her, gaining on her. She needed to move faster, faster. If that thing got its claws wrapped around her again, she'd likely be joining it in the freezing depths. Then, Providence smiled on her. In the distance, she saw the chrome doors of an elevator. Why is it always an elevator? The specifics didn't matter. She just knew in the last moment like this, it was an elevator that saved her from certain doom. And it would probably be her way out here too as long as she could get away from this rotting monster in time. Calling upon her last reserves of energy and strength after hours of swimming, Trish picked up the pace and bolted towards the elevator. She slammed the call button, 
then turned around as it hummed into life, seeing the zombie a mere ten or so feet away from her. She needed to buy time. She raised her sidearm again and opened fire, unloading the rest of the mag into the zombie's disfigured head. That's when she saw something even more nightmarish. There wasn't just one. It was a whole procession of waterlogged bodies, all marching down the narrow hallway towards her. Too many to ever possibly fight. In the nick of time, the elevator doors opened behind Trish, and she stepped backwards into the refuge of the elevator itself. She mashed the button for the floor above, feeling her anxiety spike as the zombies got closer and closer. When the doors finally closed, the zombies were mere inches away. She could feel their fists hammering on the other side. But by then, it was already too late for them. The elevator started to rise. She was safe again. For now. The back rooms holds many secrets. That probably goes without saying at this point. But like a Russian doll, oftentimes, the back rooms can offer secrets compounded within secrets. Some hiding things that you might prefer not to find. It's with this unsettling fact in mind that we once again join Trish in level four. Trish was an American soldier stationed in Afghanistan several years ago when she and her squad were accidentally no-clipped into the back rooms. Sadly, since then, Trish is the only survivor, as the back rooms enacted a horrible war of attrition against their health, sanity, and lives. Needless to say, Trish had already been through the ringer at this point, but in the grand scheme of things, the malicious forces of the back rooms were still only just getting started. She'd already faced several horrors in the enigmatic levels of the back rooms, from the sadistic and unstoppable Barnaby Bun, of Barnaby Bun's Fun Emporium, to the rotting ambulatory corpses lurking in the terrifying basement level. In some regards, Trish was relieved to be back on level four, which is generally rather safe, as long as you stay away from the windows. But Trish, still a soldier at heart, despite the loss of her guns, didn't want to settle for surviving. She wanted to get out and live. But after being repeatedly betrayed by doors, windows, elevators, and even breaking through the floorboards, she knew that she needed to try another method of escape. Lucky for Trish, her all-time favorite movie was Die Hard, so she decided to channel John McClane to get out of this jam. She'd find a way to get out through the air vents. After all, the ducks here looked big enough for even someone with her broad physique to comfortably crawl through. With her one remaining weapon, a combat knife she kept strapped to her belt, she could unlock a new potential escape route. Seeing as level four, the abandoned office, had an abundance of disused office furniture, it was easy for Trish to grab a nearby desk and push it beneath a vent on the upper half of a wall. Standing up on the desk, she was able to use her knife as a makeshift screwdriver slowly removing the rivets holding the grate in place, until she was able to remove it without causing any lasting damage. She'd learned that whenever possible, one should be quiet and discreet in here. She hoisted herself up into the vent, being careful not to move too abruptly, and began to crawl through. She tried not to enter a coughing fit as the air swam with ancient dust. These things were never as clean and stainless as they were in the movies, were they? Either way, she'd press on, until she found the way into something different. And thankfully for her, well, depending on your point of view, she soon found what she was looking for. All it took was unscrewing another grate in the vent and dropping down below. Welcome to the latest enigmatic level, the insulation, specifically area 1A. Yes, it's that kind of level. We suggest just rolling with it. As you may have noticed, this level is called the insulation because it's largely comprised of fluffy pink fiberglass attic insulation, the kind that's both good for the environment and will save you a lot of money on your monthly heating bill. Seriously, if your home or apartment isn't properly insulated, you're just throwing your money away. That aside, Trish momentarily entertained the idea that she might now be trapped in a strange world made of cotton candy because in the back rooms, who knows really? but she soon came to the more logical conclusion of attic insulation and began to explore. 
Area 1A was relatively well lit, all things considered, making it at least as hospitable as Level 4. And thanks to all that wonderful money-saving attic insulation, it was also comfortably warm and cozy, which is always a plus. The one downside so far was this strange new insulated realm was relatively cramped, forcing Trish to hug the walls on multiple occasions just to squeeze through. Even so, despite the endless fluffy insulation and aged wooden scaffolding holding it all together, the air didn't feel as stale as it probably should for such an old, cramped place. Nothing ever seemed to make sense here, but hey, she was getting used to it. The more she walked, the more elaborate and expansive the twisting halls of wood and insulation seemed to become. She began to wonder where she actually was in relation to the wider world. Was this some kind of impossible alien megastructure, an underground base, or had she really been transported into another alien dimension entirely, where everything exists on a spectrum between utterly bizarre and incredibly hostile? Was any of this even real, or just a delusion cooked up by a fractured mind? Trish concluded it probably wasn't all that constructive to dwell on these kinds of thoughts. She was best off assessing her immediate situation as well as she could and making active situational decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Otherwise, she was probably dooming herself to a stress-induced nervous breakdown and slipping into a catatonic state in a new world full of dangerous monsters. Definitely wasn't a productive idea. But soon enough, this oddly chill section of the insulation would come to an end. And when it did, Trish would probably regret not enjoying it more while it lasted. With no clear point of delineation, Trish suddenly found herself wandering into an area that appeared darker, more industrial. The pink attic insulation still abounded, but it was punctuated by wires and pipes running through the walls and out of the ground, lending to its overall more threatening vibe. While still a part of the overall insulation level, this particular zone is known as Area 1B. And if you're here, one thing can be sure, worse things are to come. But of course, Trish had no reason to know about that just yet, did she? She was still blissfully unaware of the entity she'd be meeting very, very soon. Instead, she just kept walking as her eyes adjusted to the darkness of the new area. Sometimes, the pipes hissed and rattled. The wires sparked. It was really a miracle that this whole place had never caught fire before. But knowing her luck, Trish fully expected that today would probably be the day. Was there anything of value down here? Besides the immense value for money you'll be getting if you install good quality insulation in your attic, or was it really all weird pink fluff all the way down? Luckily, Trish noticed a source of light in the distance. Tentatively, she approached, hoping this might at least be something useful. You could only imagine how intrigued Trish was when she saw that the source of the light was a hole cut into the ceiling above her. A hole that, with one good jump, she could get a decent grip on and pull herself through. So naturally, hoping to get something out of this whole venture, that's exactly what she did. We here at Backrooms Explained invite you to take a wild guess on whether Trish would come to regret this decision in the near future. When Trish emerged into the ominous, poorly lit zone known as the Crawl Space, she immediately felt something change. It was as though the very vibrations of the air had altered in some subtle manner. This was no longer the strange comfort of the endless spools of attic insulation. This was the same feeling a person might get in a video game when they see the message. You cannot fast travel when enemies are nearby. But in the back rooms, it's simply a given that at any moment, real life enemies may be nearby. So Trish simply quietly slid her combat knife out of her belt and kept walking. Something that quickly struck Trish as she ventured deeper into the crawl space was the fact that the ceiling was slightly lower here and held up by a number of brick pillars stretching off into the darkened distance. She needed to crouch a little just to move comfortably here, which only made the feeling of being on edge even worse. She kept a white knuckle grip on her combat knife, which helped to alleviate the growing feelings of dread that seemed to be slowly consuming her. Maybe, she thought to herself, she should have just stayed in the office. There was a quiet rustling somewhere in the crawl space around her. Trish, ever alert, stifled a gasp and started looking around for the source of the noise. The standard line of thinking may be to calm yourself with platitudes like, maybe it's nothing, 
But Trish's training had taught her that plenty of people had died terrible, preventable deaths, with the thought maybe it's nothing still floating around their mind. It's always something. You just don't know what it is just yet. Trish kept moving extremely slowly, making sure that every footstep was as quiet as possible. She kept looking around, eyes scanning the darkness beyond the brickwork pillars. Did she just see something move in the dark? Or is her mind just playing tricks on her? When you're worried, it's hard to separate actual evidence you're receiving from the outside and the products of your own paranoid mind. Though when you suddenly hear the spindly limbs of a highly aggressive entity galloping up behind you, it's usually a pretty good indication that you really are in trouble right now. Our heroine turned around just in time to see a monster advancing on her. This is Entity 53, more colloquially known as the Crawl Space Creature. It's a long, spindly, vaguely humanoid entity that largely moves around on all fours, with shorter hind legs and long, mantis-like clawed forelimbs that allow it to move at shocking speeds. It also has a frightening swordfish-like head with sharp teeth and a long pointed nose, allowing its highly attuned sense of smell to compensate for its poor eyesight. But right now, Trish was less concerned about the monster's physiology and more concerned about how not to be brutally slaughtered by it. Trish raised her arms as the beast bounded into her protecting her body and taking two superficial wounds to her forearms. The creature's sudden weight knocked Trish to the floor as it kept snarling, biting, and slashing at her, while Trish kicked back aggressively with her boots. But the monster just kept coming. It was fast, frightening, and had seemingly boundless energy. And to make matters worse, the initial attack had knocked the combat knife from Trish's hands, leaving her a sitting duck in the face of the creature. She could turn this situation around, but she'd need to be very quick and extremely lucky. Without both, she was as good as dead. There was no doubt about that. As the crawl space creature lunged for her again, Trish put all her remaining energy into kicking at its head. Luckily, the sudden strike stunned the beast, exactly as planned. It wouldn't last for long, but it'd last just long enough for Trish to do exactly what she'd wanted to. She reached out, grabbed her combat knife, and stabbed it into the creature. It let out the most horrific screeching noise and began leaking thick green blood as it made a hasty retreat back into the darkness. Trish didn't know how long that'd keep the beast at bay, so she wasn't going to waste a second. She sprung to her feet and got out of there like her life depended on it, because in this case, it absolutely did. She ran back to the hole she'd climbed in through and jumped back down into the darkness of Area 1B. From there, she ran back into the comforting light and warmth of Area 1A. But she didn't stop. She ran all the way back to the first vent, climbed back through, and Commando crawled back into Level 4, where she sat on the outdated carpet, huffing and puffing. It had been a living nightmare, but at least she was still living after all. Trish made one final mental note before practically passing out right there and then. Stay the hell out of the vents. Want to continue your journey into all facets of the endless mystery that is the back rooms? Check out Level Zero, Entering the Back Rooms, for more on this seemingly infinite abyss from Back Rooms Explained. See you soon, friends.